Hi everyone, welcome back to Bree's Science Lab. Today we will be going over the human skull. This is a good place to start if you're new to anatomy because most courses will cover the skull first after basic anatomy. I do have a video on anatomical terminology and recommend you watch that first if you are new to anatomy or my channel. That being said, I'm gonna go ahead and dive into the skull as anatomy lectures can get pretty lengthy. When learning any new model, you should always orientate yourself first. So, that be, that, what that means is that you want to figure out what side you're looking at, if it's upside down, a right or left, a front or back, etc. Okay, so as you've probably guessed right here, you are looking at the skull. All right, this, so this is going to be a pretty easy one because you know that you are looking at the face here. So this is anterior and this would be a lateral view. This would be a superior view. You're looking at the calvaria, which is the skull cap. This would be another lateral view. This would be a posterior view, okay? And this would actually be an inferior view if you ever asked. Right here, I'm holding the jaw. I'm gonna go ahead and place that over here. As you can see, our guy's missing a few teeth, um, but we'll come to that later. So, this goal is pretty easy to orientate yourself when you're looking at the outside. It can get a little tricky when you're looking at the inside, see? Um, but as long as you can see the face, it should be pretty easy. So now I know you'd think we were gonna start with the face, but we're actually gonna start with the skull cap, okay? Now that we've done a 360 view, this right here is the skull cap, all right? This side is the side with the face, so it's anterior. All right, this is going to be posterior right here. I'll get this little guy centered for you. And there's different parts of the skull, as you can see. And then you have these orange lines that look kind of funny. These orange lines are actually sutures. Now, sutures are skull joints specifically. So a joint is where two bones meet each other, okay? That's what a joint is. So you have joints throughout your body, and then a suture is just specifically a skull joint. So when a baby is born, right, their heads are malleable, okay, in case you didn't know that. They're malleable so they can fit through the birth canal. And that's why these are not fully formed when a fetus or baby is born, okay? But both these sutures and the bones are going to have different names, all right? So we're going to start with this right here. This is known as your frontal bone, your frontal bone, okay? These are known as your parietal bones, your parietal bones. If I tip it backwards, this is known as your occipital bone, your occipital bone. As you can see, your occipital bone is a lot smaller than that frontal bone. So if you ever are just looking at the skull cap and you can't figure out which one is which, the frontal bone is going to be a lot bigger. Just think, foreheads are a lot, are really big, right? Now, I'm gonna show you a lateral view really quick just so I can show you the last um, bone that makes up kind of the skull cap area. This is your temporal bone, all right? If I flip it over, you have another one over here, okay? So, I'll put that down. Those are the bones of the skull, right? Then, we have to name these sutures. So, this first suture is gonna be known as a coronal suture a coronal suture, so kind of like a coronal cut, it goes up and down your body, separating a front and a back half. So if that helps, just think the coronal suture is kind of like that, right? It's going straight up and down, separating a front and a back. Then we're gonna have this suture right here. This is going to be your sagittal suture, all right? So similar to a sagittal cut, going um, straight down, separating a left and right hemisphere. This is a sagittal suture separating a left and a right half, right? And then you're going to have a lambdoid suture. This is your lambdoid suture back here, all right? Your lambdoid suture. And then you're also going to have a squamous suture, a squamous suture. And that is this one right here, separating those parietal bones right here from the temporal bones. That's your squamous suture. Okay. Now, at the point where multiple sutures, one or sorry, two or more come together, those points are also going to have a name. So this one right here is known as bregma, bregma, all right? 
and that is B-R-E-G-M-A, so bregma. This one back here is lambda, right? Lambda. Now, how I remember this, right? If you go out to eat, you're gonna have bread with your appetizer, right? When you go to a restaurant, they're gonna give you bread first. So bregma for bread is gonna come first. And then lamb would be an entree if you eat meat, right? So lambda is gonna be in the back because it comes after your appetizer, which would be bread. Or you can think of it as breakfast for bregma and lunch for lambda, whichever one you prefer. Okay, now, all right, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go back to this view because as you can see, there's a lot of orange lines. And we're actually going to start with this area right here. This is your terion, all right, terion, but that's with a P, all right, PT, kind of like pterodactyl. All right, that's going to be terion. And this is the weakest part of your skull, okay? This is because a whole bunch of fusing is happening right here. So that's going to be the weakest part. That's where your temple is. All right. Then this part right here, this is known as asterion. Asterion. Okay. This is the point in the back of your skull where all of these sutures fuse. How I remember this, okay, is pterion is up here, weakest point of the skull. And asterion, okay, um, A-S-S -S would be in the back right? So, asterion is spelled with just one S, but I think of that um, as A-S-S, -S, so we know it's in the back, right? So, asterion. All right, great. So, now that we've gone through all of those, we're going to go ahead and we're going to go over the face, right? So, the anterior portion. So, that's right here. All right, now there's a lot of stuff going on and that is perfectly okay. We're going to take it really slow right so first things first we're actually going to start and we're going to go from top downwards okay i think that's a little bit easier so we're going to start right here we know that this is the top right so this is the superior portion this is the inferior portion we know that because of these teeth and the eyes it makes it kind of obvious because we know our own faces pretty well but this right here is the unibrow right right here, so glabella. This is known as the glabella, where your unibrow would be, right? If you had just a connection right here, this would be your glabella, okay? Then if we go kind of laterally, all right, we have our supraorbital margin, our supraorbital margin. That's this right here, okay? Supra meaning above, right? Orbital referring to the eyes, and margin referring to the length, kind of how it's the margin of this area. So this is going to be your supraorbital margin. All right. That being said, when you have a supra, you're usually going to have an infra as well, which means below. So this is your infraorbital margin, your infraorbital margin. And you want to go ahead and remember that you're going to have um, most of these structures on either side. Uh, so you're going to have two of these because your face is symmetrical. So if these structures aren't median, meaning exactly on the midline, you're uh, more than likely going to have two sets. Okay. Now, so that was the infraorbital margin. This was the supraorbital margin. But as you can tell, there's a little bit of a notch right here. All right. A little bit of a notch. That's going to be your supraorbital notch, right? So this is your supraorbital margin. This is going to be your supraorbital notch. Okay. All right, awesome possum. So now we're going to get into kind of the eye area since we went over the margin already. Now, I'm going to try and tilt this the best I can. All righty. So I'm trying to show you right here the first thing. If you guys can see, I'll raise it a little bit. This is going to be your optic canal. If you notice, there's a little circle right there. That's where your optic nerve is going to run through. All right, your optic canal. Right next to it, all right, you're going to have your superior orbital fissure. You definitely don't want to get these confused, okay? The superior orbital fissure is going to refer to the super, super long opening, all right? Let me go ahead. This is the sup superior orbital fissure, all right? However, this is that optic canal, if you guys can see that. It's the circular one, okay? So... Then, 
like I said, you usually have a supra and an infra. If you have a superior, you're usually gonna have an inferior as well. This isn't a hard and fast rule. There are some exceptions, but this is a general rule. All right, so your inferior orbital fissure, let me turn it a little bit, is right here, okay? Right there. It's the one that's uh, more lower, so below the other ones, okay? And that's your inferior orbital fissure. Now, that being said, we're going to go ahead and we're going to go to the nose now. We're going to skip the rest of the eye and we're going to go here first because I think it's a little bit easier. We have three nasal concha and three nasal meatuses or meati, all right? Now, those are in the nose. However, on most models, you're only gonna be able to see two of them, and the third is gonna be hidden, and you're not gonna see it, but it's supposed to be up here, all right? So, a uh, conca would be this one right here. So these little bumps you see, those are gonna be the conca. All right, let me go ahead and raise it a little bit. There's another one, you can see them on this side as well. However, in between them, all right, so in between the bumps right here, you're gonna have meatuses, all right? Meati, meatuses. Those are in between. So, like I said, you have three, but you can only see two on this model. So this first one down here, we're gonna start down here. This is your inferior nasal concha, all right? Inferior nasal concha. Then you're gonna have your middle nasal concha. Even though it's the highest one, you're gonna have a middle nasal concha right here. Above that would be your superior nasal concha. However, you cannot see that on here. All right, then you're gonna have those meati or meatuses, right? So this area right here would be that inferior nasal meatus. Right here, if I raise it, would be that middle nasal meatus, all right? And then up here would be that superior nasal meatus, and then above that would be that superior nasal concha. All right, so then right in the middle going down, all right, this line that you see right here, this is your perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. Perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. All right, however, this point right here, and I'm going to tilt it so you guys can see it better. This point right here is known as a vomer, a vomer. So this is not the ethmoid bone, all right? This is not part of the ethmoid bone. This is vomer. This is the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone, though, okay? And basically how it works is vomer is actually underneath that perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone, and this point is just showing you the end of it. So it kind of comes out more and sticks up above after coming out, if that, if that helps to explain it. Now, we are gonna go over this border right here, since it's right here, right above the teeth, all right? He has, this model has nice pretty teeth, but right above it, this border would be your superior alveolar border, all right? Or just known as your alveolar border. Um, however, uh, below your mandible right here, that could also be called an alveolar border. All right, now, we're going to go back up to the eye area, and I'm going to tilt this down a little bit, okay? So this is the top of the nose. You're seeing uh, the left side right now, right? Um, you can tell that they are equal on either side, though, right? So we're just going to look at one side to make it a little bit easier. Oops. First, all right, we're going to go over nasalis, all right? And I have a little mnemonic for you to remember this at the end, but I'm going to just wait on that, all right? First, I'm gonna tell you the names of all of these. So, you're gonna start with nasalis. That is this one right here, all right? The orange is separating, by the way. So this all right here is nasalis. Then, you're gonna have your maxilla. Maxilla would be this one. And this is actually all of your maxilla right here, all right? This is all your maxilla, including this portion right here. Then, if I turn it a little more, you're gonna have your lacrimal bone, your lacrimal bone. 
Your lacrimal bone actually contains your lacrimal canal and fossa for the lacrimal sac. So if I kind of tilt it, you can see this little hole on the lacrimal bone. Fossa or canal, they refer to holes, and that is what the lacrimal canal or fossa is, which is for the lacrimal sac, which is part of your tear duct, all right? So we had uh, nasalis, maxilla, uh, lacrimal bone. This is your ethmoid bone. All right, ethmoid bone. So like perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone, right? Ethmoid bone. And you can also see this from multiple places, all right? Now we're gonna get to your sphenoid bone, all right? This is your sphenoid bone or sphenoid, however you like to pronounce it. That's S-P-H, by the way, sphenoid bone. And this is gonna be seen from multiple areas as well, all right? But this is your sphenoid bone. This is your zygomatic bone your zygomatic bone. All of this is actually your zygomatic bone. Um, this is specifically your zygomatic arch, and they have other names as well that we're going to get to. But how do you remember these, right? There's a lot right here, and they're on both sides. So how are we going to memorize these? Well, I'm going to give you a little trick. All right, this mnemonic was taught to me when I was taking anatomy a long, long time ago. Um, now my little eyes see Zs, all right? So if you're really tired of watching my videos or going to your anatomy classes, your eyes are probably getting a little heavy. You're getting tired, right? You're probably going to fall asleep. Well, hopefully not in my videos, but it's a possibility, right? So now, N for nasalis, N for now, now my M, M, Y for my, or M for maxilla, now my little for lacrimal bone, L for lacrimal bone or little, now my little eyes for ethmoid bone, or E for eyes, C, all right, as in S, E, E, or S as in sphenoid bone, all right, C, Z's for zygomatic bone, all right? Zygomatic bone Z. Now my little I see Z's, all right? Hopefully not in my class again, but you never know, all right? And that is how you memorize all of those little parts. And then of course you have those uh, fossas and canals and fissures that we already went over, all right? Now, that's pretty much the face. So we're gonna go over these last few parts just here on the lateral view, right? Because we're looking at it from the side. All right, ignore that. Um, let's see. Well, both sides have that. Oh, well. All right. We are gonna go over the zygomatic arch. All right, so this part of the zygomatic bone, as you can see, this is zygomatic bone right here. This is the zygomatic arch. And this, as a reminder, is the temporal bone. So this little guy gets a little tricky, right? So, this line and over, right? This line and over is known as the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. The temporal process of the zygomatic bone. So, this is the zygomatic bone, all right? This is the temporal bone. If you remember from my terminology video, a process is a piece of bone jutting off, okay, of the main body. So this piece is jutting off of the zygomatic bone towards the temporal bone. So this is the temporal process of the zygomatic bone because it's part of the zygomatic bone, right? However, from this line, orange line over, all right, this is the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. All right, zygomatic process, because it's going towards the zygomatic bone, of the temporal bone, because it's coming off of the temporal bone. It's still part of that. All right, so hopefully that's a little bit easier to understand now. That leaves only a few more structures, all right? We have a few more processes. This is one of them right here. I'm gonna kind of turn it so you guys can see it from a few different angles. It's pretty big. This is known as the mastoid process. The mastoid process, it's pretty big. It's jutting off of that main bone, right? And then this is your styloid process. This little guy right here, all right? I'm gonna raise this up so you guys can see a little better. This is your styloid process. How I remember this is it kind of looks like a stylus or like a pen right that you're writing with it's kind of thin at the end here so styloid process 
awesome. And then I'm gonna raise this up so you can see it a little bit better. This right here, are there any guesses as to what this is? Okay, I can put my, my uh, pen through it a little bit. If you said your external auditory meatus or external auditory canal, you would be right, all right? So there's a few different names for this. Um, as long as you make sure you include external and auditory or ear, uh, you're probably safe, right? This is the um, outside part of the ear canal, okay? So awesome. So we went over the skull cap already, right? We went over the face, the anterior portion, the lateral portion. Now, uh, we are going to go over the mandible before I get inside the skull. Yes, you do have to know the inside of the skull as well. So here is the mandible. This is the only movable bone of your skull, so it's pretty fun. Um, our, our little model's missing teeth. I am not sure how that uh, happened, but oh well. Now, you should know that this region right here is called your mental region. So how I think of this is, if you guys know that Lincoln statue where he's like thinking um, and he has his like little uh, hand on his chin and he's like rubbing his chin, I like to think like mental, oh, like the Lincoln statue, he's thinking, you know, really thinking hard. Anyways, mental region, if that helps, you know, just think of like when you're like mentally thinking, you put, you use that stance, right? So mental region. All right, this, this little bump, if you can't see it, this little bump right here is called your mental protuberance, which is another word for a bump, your mental protuberance. Then this line right here is your mental synthesis, your mental synthesis, all right? Then on these, these little uh, holes, again, holes can be for ramen, right? Holes are for ramen. These are your mental for ramen. Your mental for ramen. All right. Now, that's pretty much all you have to know on this anterior view. So we're going to go to the side. And guess what? These little pieces right here are jutting off of that main bone, aren't they? Right. So these are going to be known as processes. So this is your coronoid process. Your coronoid process. You have one on either side your coronoid process, and this is your condyloid process, your condyloid process. How do you remember these? They are very similar, yes, all right? So how I used to teach this is your coronoid process, all right? Your core classes, when you are studying for your degree, your core classes are most important. They're gonna come first in your schedule, right? So coronoid process is going to come first, right? It's going to be closer to the teeth. But condyloid, con, right? Very bad. Um, cons are in the back, right? Think of those as like your useless classes that you don't really need. Those are going to be towards the back. So condyloid, bad, con, towards the back. This is your condyloid process. It's going to be found more posteriorly. All right. Speaking of posterior, we're going to look at the posterior view of the mandible now, right? Because you will have to know this as well for your class. And you'll notice we have more foramen, all right? So we have those mental foramen on the front. Here, I'll raise this up. Now we're going to have those mandibular foramen. So the mandibular foramen are actually going to be on the back or the posterior. Those are your mandibular foramen. And then you're going to have your mylohyoid groove right here, your mylohyoid groove. And you're going to learn more about that when we go over the face muscles, but that is pretty much all for the mandible, right? So awesome. We're done with that. So I'm going to kind of move this off to the side so it's not in our way. And we're going to go back to the main portion of the skull, all right? And I'm going to give you that 360 view again, right? Okay. I'm going to put it back down. I'm going to take off the skull cap, okay? So here's the skull and cap. I'm taking it off, right? And now you can see this little guy right here, all right? This is still a superior view, right? Because you are looking down. Now it's just cut, all right? This is a horizontal cut. Um, or a transverse cut, however you prefer it. It's cutting a top and a bottom. Now, I'm actually going to turn it like this. All right, so this right here, anterior portion, right? This right here is posterior. I'm going to go ahead and put it down. Now, 
all right? There's a lot of things, all right? And I don't want anyone to get overwhelmed. I am gonna tell you a story at the very end that's gonna bring all of these pieces together. But first, I'm gonna start by naming them, all right? There are three regions known as fossa, right? And you can kind of see them. So here's the first little region, the second little region, all right? You can see how they kind of did it a little bit. And then the third one's back here. This area is known as the anterior cranial fossa, your middle cranial fossa, all right? And your posterior cranial fossa. And those regions might not be tested a lot, but it's a good way to kind of divide the skull into sections to learn. This is actually gonna be that frontal bone, if you guys remember. Your frontal bone, all right? If it helps, I'll do this. There's your forehead. There's your frontal bone, right? You also have that parietal bone right here that you already learned. This is just the inside view. Uh, you have your occipital bone. Nothing really special back here. All right, so that's nice. And then you also have that temporal bone right here, all right, that little section. And then you see there's a lot more little structures. So we're gonna start by naming the ethmoid bone. This is a part of your ethmoid bone. This is known as your crista galli, crista galli, all right? Around it is the cribiform plate, the cribiform plate, which contain your olfactory foramen, your olfactory foramen. Olfactory refers to the nose and the smelling uh, sense, all right? So olfactory foramen, those are for smelling. Then this is all your sphenoid bone right here, all your sphenoid bone, all right? But they divide it into two parts. This is your lesser wing, all right? This like raised portion, this is all your lesser wing. And then this is your greater wing down here. It's a little bit bigger, right? Can you guys see that? All of that is your greater wing. So and those are the two wings of the sphenoid bone. I like to think it's like a butterfly almost or a moth. Fun fact, I do not like butterflies or moths. I find them very scary, but that's what it reminds me of, okay? But the skull is nothing to be scared of. That being said, we're gonna have your anterior clinoid processes right here. If you guys notice, these little pieces are jutting off of the skull. These are your anterior clinoid processes. These are your posterior clinoid processes. Process refers to the singular version. Um, processes is just plural, in case you guys are wondering why I change it up. Um, posterior clinoid processes. Um, process, if you guys remember from my first video, is referring to something jutting off the main body. So this is bone, it's usually gonna refer to bone, and these are kind of jutting off. You guys actually already know what these little holes right here are. These, all right, are those optic canals. So I'll try to point, um, let's see, there we go. If you guys see that little, my little pin coming through, that was your optic canal. We went over that when we were going over the face. This is the optic canal as well. So those optic nerves are gonna go through there, right? All right. So that's great if like something goes through and you're able to recognize that, that's awesome, all right? Now, that being said, what fissure do you guys think this is? If you guys can see that, all right? What fissure do you guys think that is? I'm gonna go ahead and stick it through. If you said the superior orbital fissure, you would be correct, all right? Now, superior orbital fissure. All right, awesome possum, okay? And now, this right here, this area right here is known as your cella tertica. Your cella tertica. I'll try to give you a 360 view of that. All right, your cella tertica. Now, this is actually where your pituitary gland is going to sit, and you're gonna learn about that in the brain video, which is coming up. But this area back here is known as clivus, clivus. All right, this portion of the temporal bone right here is actually known as the petrous portion, all right? And you can see that I can pinch it. So I like to say petrous pinch or petrous portion pinch. 
because it's you can pinch it. This is that petrous portion of the temporal bone. All right. Now you have just a few more things here and they're all gonna be holes or canals. So I'm gonna go ahead and go over them. We already went over the olfactory foramen and the optic canals. Now we're gonna go over the foramen spinosum. Foramen spinosum, it's that little hole under the superior orbital fissure, if you guys can see that. All right, this little hole right here, that is <laughs> foramen rotundum. Foramen rotundum. It's very, very round, if that helps. Foramen rotundum. This is going to be foramen ovale, this little bigger one right here, ovale. It's kind of an oval shaped. And then right next to it is going to be foramen spinosum. It's super, super small, all right? Foramen spinosum. Right next to the cella tertica, you're going to have foramen lacerum, okay? Then... If we move backwards, you're gonna have internal auditory canal, internal auditory canal or meatus, all right? This right here is gonna be your hypoglossal canal, hypoglossal canal on either side of the foramen magnum or magnum foramen, which is the second biggest foramen in your body, I believe. And then this is your jugular foramen, jugular foramen. And then last but not least, you're gonna have your carotid canal, which is a little difficult to see, all right? So I'm gonna do my best here. It's right next to that foramen lacerum. Um, if I can change the lighting up a bit. There you go. Foramen lacerum is gonna be right there. So, yeah, that is the skull view, okay? Now I'm gonna tell you a little story. Now, I learned this story from my class as well as when I was teaching, and you can find a few other videos or resources on this story, but it's known as the Cowboy Ross story. And I change it up a little bit to include everything that I want. So, you can change it up as you see fit, but this is just gonna be my version of the Cowboy Ross story. Starting with Cowboy Ross, all right. He is very specific on how you spell his name. It is R-O-S, Cowboy Ross. Why is he specific on how you spell your name? Well, he is named according to Foramen Rotundum, Foramen Ovale, and Foramen Spinosum. If you didn't pick up on that, Rotundum starts with R, Ovale starts with O, and Spinosum starts with S. So, Rotundum, Ovale, and Spinosum, Cowboy Ross, all right? Cowboy Ross cannot be a cowboy without a horse, all right? His horse is known as Clivus, all right? His horse is known as Clivus, and if you want to sit on a horse, uh, they typically don't ride bareback cowboys, but they do have nice saddles to ride on. So, Cowboy Ross is a very, you know, bougie cowboy, and he gets all of his saddles from a very nice shop. Uh, all of the products are made from Turkey. So, this is the Sela Tershika, or the Turkish saddle that Cowboy Ross is going to put on Clivus so he can sit on him. All right? But a saddle is not the only thing you need because you're going to have to be able to steer your horse, right? So you're going to need the anterior clinoid processes. If you can imagine a little cowboy sitting here on his saddle, he's going to put his hands right here to steer. So on the anterior clinoid processes, that's what he's going to use to steer. But he also is going to have to break. Unfortunately for him, he his horse does not listen. Clivus is a terrible listener, right? So instead of usually doing the whole, whoa, horsey, you know, slow down, all right, he's actually going to use these little breaks back here. These are your posterior clinoid processes. Your posterior clinoid processes. And he uses those to break. Great, right? Cowboy Ross can steer, but... There's no point in steering if he can't see, right? Good thing he can. He uses his optic canals to see. His optic canals, right? Which are right up here at the front of the horse. So, awesome, right? But there's one other thing. 
where does he put his boots, right? He's gonna fly off if he doesn't have his little boots inside of his stirrups, okay? So Cowboy Ross will put his boots and lace them up in Foramen Lacerum right here next to Clivus, all right? Foramen Lacerum. That being said, right next to his boots are also Clivus's favorite snacks. And what is a horse's favorite snacks? That is right, carrots. All right, carrots are gonna be in the carotid canal, which are found right here next to his boots in Foramen Lacerum. This is the carotid canal, all right? That's where his favorite snacks are kept. All right, but Cowboy Ross would not be a cowboy if he did not go on long adventures. So let's go ahead and go over his long adventure that he loves to take, right? So starting off, he is gonna go on a little adventure, right? And he's gonna take his little horse and he's gonna go all the way around here until he gets to these mountains. Now, these are very, very dangerous mountains. These are known as the Petrus Portion Pinch Mountains, okay? These mountains right here are very, very dangerous. Why, you might ask? Because they are filled with dangerous animals. If you didn't know this, horses are prey animals. All right, horses are prey animals. They get spooked by everything because everything is after them pretty much, right? If you have ever seen Flicka, it's a movie and it's about a horse where a mountain lion um, tries to get it, right? I don't wanna spoil it for anyone, but mountain lions are one of horses' biggest predators. So this is filled with mountain lions, bears, all kinds of things, right? So. Cowboy Ross has to be very careful and listen as he's going over these mountains right here. He's gonna listen using his internal auditory canals, right? He's gonna listen for those bears and mountain lions and all those kinds of dangerous things, all right? Thankfully, Cowboy Ross and Clive make it over these mountains and they listen out for these animals and they do not run into any of them. Thank goodness, right? And so after all of that, you know, Cowboy Ross is like, great job, you know, Clivus, you made it through the mountains. They practically cantered or trotted, whatever. They ran through the mountains, right? And they made it, and so Clivus is super tired, and Cowboy Ross gets him jugs of water from the jugular foramen at the end of the mountain. And they drink up those jugs of water and they are super, super hydrated now, which is, which is great, right? Because now they're in this nice, nice town and Cowboy Ross is a bit of a player. So he's in this new town and he's looking for all of the ladies, right? But all of the ladies, you know, you don't want to just be, you know, out there uh, not practicing safe uh, stuff, right? So he keeps his magnums in the Foramen Magnum, all right? That is a PG-13 version. I sure hope everyone's okay with that. Foramen Magnum. But this one lady is suspicious. She's like, hmm, Cowboy Ross, that's very suspicious. So she does what many of us do, and she hides a little lip gloss in the hypoglossal canal. Hypoglossal canal of Clivus, of his bags and stuff, because she figured when Cowboy Ross went home, if he did possibly have a wife, she would find that lip gloss and know. So, that's great, but Cowboy Ross does not know about this lip gloss, and so he travels all the way back to the cribiform plate, and what do you know? Krista Golly, or Crystal, his wife is at his crib, their home, right? Another word for home. And she finds that hypoglossal canal and she says, Cowboy Ross, no more adventures for you. All right, and that is the Cowboy Ross story. I sure hope you guys enjoyed that. I'm gonna go ahead and put this all back together. And we're gonna go over this last view right here, all right? This is gonna be really, really quick. I'm just gonna kind of run through this because my video is almost over. You're gonna be able to see Foramen Ovale right here, right here, Foramen Ovale. Right next to Foramen Ovale, if you remember, O and S. This is Foramen Spinosum, all right? This is Foramen Lacerum, Foramen Magnum. Here was that jugular foramen, 
and that carotid canal was right here, all right, just from a different view, this is going to be your incisive foramen, all right? This is your incisor, where if you guys remember your like teeth names, these are your, your incisors, so I like to say incisive foramen. This is the palatine process of the maxilla, all right, all right up here. But after this little line, it becomes the horizontal plate of the palatine bone. So I like to say right after that horizontal line is the horizontal plate of the palatine bone. Then you're going to have what are the medial and lateral pterygoid plates. Pterygoid is with a P, but these are those medial and lateral pterygoid plates right here. This is where you're going to have a face, some face muscles attached, which will make a lot more sense when we go over those face muscles. This is a vomer, in case you guys remember. So I said vomer was under that ethmoid bone. This is vomer because we're now looking at an inferior view. These are known as your palatine foramen. So anything to do with that like mouth area is gonna have the word palatine usually. So these are palatine foramen. And this is hamulus, hamulus, all right? And that being said, I just wanna actually point out really quick that styloid process and that the processes right here, you can also see them from this view, all right? So thank you for joining me here on Bree Science Lab and I hope you enjoyed that. Stay tuned for the brain video.